There is a looming fight, a battle. If it be a war, it be fought with but words and conviction. It is about money, ought it be or not. It is so strongly akin to the fight over slavery that the comparison can't and ought not be ignored. While it would be hyperbolic to say that wage labor is slave labor, such does speak towards the point in no small measure. But the battle, the loomingness of it revolves more cunningly and specifically as it did around slavery itself. Does the freedom and liberty to do include the freedom and liberty to enslave? The tact here to be plain is that the role of money as a device that forces people to labor, forces folks to work to live, and indeed may force people to work at the whims and desires of others. Are all dollars but little whips in the hands of petty taskmasters? There is a real counterpoint that isn't at least so obviously ethically defunct as the counterpoint to this that was uttered in the antebellum era. We all do in fact need to work, more or less at any rate. There actually is a real question as to how to best go about organizing that labor requirement. And in terms of freedom and liberties, it is likely the case that having the ability to be the one with the whip in the sense being used here isn't exactly akin to being the slaver. To make the old antebellum point on slavery clear, there was a position that held something like the freedom of commerce, the freedoms in life in general, entail also the freedoms to own other people. The connection to commerce is important, as it speaks to the ownership aspect of slavery. But there was an additional point to it, namely, that the more generalized version absolute freedom entails the freedom to own others also entails the freedom of slaves to rebel. There is a certain sense of, oh, I don't want to be too charitable to the point, but there is a certain sense of consistency to the more generalized version. It's brutal, too brutal, cruel, too cruel, and it has of it its own plausibly inherent contradictions to it which I think are obvious at least these days, but for all that, there is a something there to the notion that holds to the slaves the same kinds of standards as their masters. For this reason, holding to the commerce aspect was argued to be less brutal and cruel, as it systematized slavery, and stopped the notions of rebellions of the slaves by way of laws surrounding the rights of ownership, rather than laws around the rights to rule over others by force, which is a bit more like what the generalized version of this argument held to. It was of course exceedingly brutal, and I'd argue even more brutal, as it forced by law the status of slavery which may have been resolved far sooner by way of force otherwise. It likely made the conditions of slavery worse, in the sense that if being held by way of mere force on the individual level, there wouldn't be any state sponsorship of the slavery to keep it in place in the face of brutality. In other words, in the generalized version, where slave rebellions were ethically and hence legally justified, there would be pretty strong incentives on the part of slavers to not do things so as to spark a slave rebellion. Being brutal and cruel as slavers being exactly the kinds of things that would reasonably be more likely to spark such a rebellion. We might also argue that the generalized version entails shorter terms of slavery, as rebellions might be more likely to occur in general. Whereas with an economic justification for freedom to own slaves, there is a state power that backs up the individual freedoms to enforce the slavery. No longer restrained by the capacity of the individual to force the point on slaves, but rather, restrained by the capacity of the state to force the point on slaves. Now, of course both versions are abhorrent. Slavery is not a valid form of freedom for an individual. One does not have the freedom by right to own slaves in any case. But there is something of worth and note here regarding how the generalized right to, say, own property, to force others to work for you by way of money is one thing and is maybe less brutal, and more intuitive to our sense of ethics as being perhaps fine. While having laws that enforce that is another kind of thing entirely, I suspect that folks' ethical intuitions with, say, libertarianism, or more broadly, with a notion of freedom of commerce or freedom of enterprise or freedom of business, whereby we want to say there is something intuitively sound to the notion that individuals ought have the freedom to labor as they see fit, and perhaps even use money towards that end, is predicated upon this supposed generalized version of the freedom. But the reality is that those freedoms of the individual to labor as they want and pay people as they want are actually forced by law, not by everyone's individual freedoms to do so. This also isn't exactly the classic libertarian argument, though I know it sounds a bit like it. The point isn't a concern with regulation. The point is a matter of state sponsorship of commerce at all. The enforcement of, for instance, private property or copyright laws or laws that prevent the sharing of music, movies, books, etc., all of which aim specifically towards the protection of individuals' freedoms to do commerce. Amazon doesn't have any capacity to enforce its onerous rules of commerce. 
The state does. If we were to take the freedom argument here seriously, that is, the freedom argument to do commerce, entrepreneurship, etc., seriously, it would entail pretty directly that it would be wrong for the state to force that upon people. If Corporation X is doing a bad, polluting some place, for instance, the freedoms of commerce would entail the rights of others to simply stop it. The competition methodology, in other words, simply already entails the freedom to overturn the bad corporation, whereby only the corporation itself on its own merits would stand or fall. However, we don't have that. We have state-sponsored commerce, whereby folks no longer have the freedom to do such things as a means of checks on commerce. Perhaps the more concise example to the point would be, if so and so produces something, and the state forces folks to not be allowed to copy it or produce it themselves, we aren't really speaking of freedom of commerce anymore. We are speaking of state-sponsored commerce. In a similar vein of thought, there is a prima facie point here regarding monies as a medium of commerce, but it isn't synonymous with commerce. Folks far too oft mistake the movements of monies for the movements of commerce in a direct sense. But monies are an intermediary for the movements of commerce simpliciter. Another and another important point here as we parse these points of freedoms and liberties out. These are interesting points, and they will come up a bit later in this piece, but first I want to bring it to the question of organizing labor at all. The claim to defend money's use would have to be that the use of money organizes labor better than not, and rather specifically, by way of organizing who is in charge. Here we are focusing on labor in particular as labor is a foundational piece of commerce as it relates to freedoms and liberties. Someone has to be the boss, the manager, etc. Someone's has to be the leaders, and presumably granting everyone at least reasonably equal access to that possibility is in fact a boon, and not a detractor to freedom and liberty. There are weaknesses to the argument though. For bosses, managers, leaders, yes. But they don't hold the whims of survival over the workers in a moneyless, free labor society. There is, I mean, a bit of a play on words, a bit of a dodging of the point with that counterpoint, for it masks the ugly realities of at least the way that moneyed capitalistic societies are these days. Perhaps the way that any moneyed society at all is, by way of claiming that bosses, managers, leaders, etc., must be thus by way of money, and that money doesn't play a perverting role to the ethics of those positions. The base predicable reality is one of free labor, not free capital. Free labor may freely, even meritoriously, and equitably divide up the bosses, the leaders, and the managers without recourse to the means of money's perversions of the ethics involved. I want to name a few obvious and particularly egregious points of money's perversion of labor commerce. In terms of equitability of the division, as we are speaking of how labors are divided up, not wealth or monies, we'll see quickly how a roughly proportional number of folks from each relevant subgrouping in a population are within the various labors equitably. For, there are no perverse incentives of money to do otherwise. I mean, for instance, there isn't a real reason why so and so wants to be in charge as boss or manager of a plant based on the monies involved. To make that clearer, when a specific job or type of job has wildly disproportionate rewards to it compared to other labors, when the pay and benefits of wealth accrual for a given job are wildly divergent from others, there becomes perverse incentives to have that job. Those incentives make it such that folks unequitably divide that labor, favoring their own subgroupings, and ultimately tending to favor the dominant subgrouping. We might well hold to a fairly simple principle here, that the greater the divergence in rewards offered, the greater the inequitability of the division. There may be other such inequitable motives for a labor commerce, such as kinds of labors being more or less prestigious, or being more or less dangerous, more or less hard, etc. But all those would necessarily be a part of the money commerce, and hence would tend to exacerbate the divergence. We might aim towards trying to do otherwise with money in some sort of juster compensation effort, as in, this job is dangerous, so they get thus as an additional offset. However, I think this runs afoul the reality that differing people actually prefer differing labors, such that even if no one were forced there would be plenty of folks who prefer the dangerous, read exciting, jobs out there. The justness of it all stemming more from the freely chosenness of it, the voluntarily of it, rather than the false enticements of money's motivations. We can also argue effectively, I think, that the desires to do labors are something of a naturally just state that can be perverted. To continue with the dangerousness example, to offer more rewards for it via money's illusory boons, we are thereby potentially harming people by providing them with in essence a bribe to get them to do the thing. 
If they are desperate, they might take it. In other words, the equitability of the division is equitable or not predicated exactly upon the desires of the subgrouping. Here we too glimpse an issue with the perversion by strict equality. Forcing a subgrouping into labors it isn't inclined towards, or diverting them from labors they are inclined towards, is itself a perversion of the just divisions of labors. The accumulation of capital is the accumulation of that perversion of the underpinning ethic of free labor in the roles of leaders, bosses and managers. To have piles of monies means to have at one's disposal the means of forcing others to work at tasks with you doing the desires for them to work at. A kind of robbing of the desires of others towards your own. Even if we were to pretend that there wasn't a need for money to survive, we'd still be pushing the labor as an extra enticement to labor, such that the accumulation of huge piles of it would be a perversion of the underlying labor movement. Whereas, sans any moneyed means of force or enticement, labor might gravitate towards other sorts of areas of commerce, based on, say, the safety or usefulness of the commerce. Pay me a bunch, maybe I'd do that silly thing you asked me to do. It being silly because it is useless and we all know it is useless. Or that dangerous task, the task that is perhaps too dangerous to do compared to the rewards of the labor overall. But absent that pay, regardless as to if that pay is predicated on a forced need of survival or upon a mere enticements of money's niceties, why would I do either? Labor as a mode of organizing labor in other words places other sorts of motives on the labors that are done. Moneyed organizing of labor also distorts the underpinning labor's motives by way of the drive to make it. By this I mean bluntly that moneyed motives in commerce favor commerce that makes more money. That kind of moneyed motive is clearly not the motivating forces of labors as the determining means of commerce. One simply doesn't do labors for the point of making more money. The labors are done predicated upon the pragmatics of the labors themselves. Is the labor useful? Noting that useful could be frivolous, making toys is in fact useful. Toys are enjoyable, that is a pragmatic useful thing to do one's labors for. It makes the world a better place by making toys. Frivolous labors are ones whose products are themselves unwanted, but then they are made specifically to make money anyway. Think of high-pressure sales tactics here, or products that are pushed and advertised upon people heavily as a means of marketing towards them just to purchase some piece of garbage product. Other sorts of frivolous labors are such things as scams of all sorts. Moneyed motives of commerce perverts the labors towards desires of scams simply to make monies. The value of a labor there is entirely about the monies themselves. The labors are fake, objectively useless, or even objectively harmful. Another perversion of labors relates to the perverse incentives thereof. The, for instance, environmental harms that might accrue by the doing of a labors are not accountable in the moneyed systemizations of labor. They must be imposed upon them, for money's motives of commerce simply doesn't care as it's generally cheaper to make and pollute. Labor's motives being different, specifically in that they are directly tied to the areas they are living in. I mean to say, that the notion of if to pollute or not is one that the laborers themselves have to deal with, one way or another. To live within it, or be responsible for the cleanup, or be responsible for the not polluting in the first place, or any or all of these. Money concerns don't enter the picture. Concerns of lazy laborers do, but nonetheless that kind of motivating factor at least does have to directly reckon with the issues of pollution. There is a real balancing of some sort that would thereby occur without outside intervention upon the commerce. Not necessarily suggesting that such would be enough, you may still need regulations from outside the labor commerce forces to help direct those issues. But then, they would also have an internal motivating force to work with. Something as simple as education and propaganda on the matters may actually suffice for the commerce of labor. If there is a smart way from labor's perspective to maximize the benefits of choices in when and how to pollute and clean up, they themselves would be thereby exactly motivated to do so. Whereas moneyed motives have no such internal motivation. All such efforts are pretty much outside its purview. Moneyed isn't made by laboring at something you can't sell. These kinds of distortions of the systems are important for noticing how commerce can be regulated along different principles than monies. Something that may be unintuitive for people, that is covered in depth in the Moneyless Free Labor Society series. But here I want to hammer specifically on the questions of labors, as its own motivated commerce systemization compares with money's motivating factors for freedoms and liberties of labors. There is but a small point in that which relates to the distortion effects of monies. We might well suppose that in general labor prefers to do less. Work smarter, not harder, to quote the duck, 
such as in a lazy principle so much as an intelligence principle. Let us call that the efficiencies of labor's motives. This is akin to a moneyed motives regarding labor's. Lower expenses the better, generally speaking the less labor the less costly. But there are striking differences in terms of what they would tend to choose or end up with. A position here is going to be that money's concerns for efficiencies entails the elimination of labor or the trivializing of it, rather than the utilizations of it towards efficient ends and aims in production. The intelligence principle of labor's motivations are not aimed towards the making of money as a measure of success, but rather in a serious sense the smartness of the labor ethic. Quality of product comes to matter a great deal, whereby quality means durability or longevity of usefulness per unit of labor used. That kind of efficiency leads towards exponential growth in quality, for on iteration one of the key factors for growth will be to enhance the means of utility, versatility in a sense, which could multiply the durability and longevity of usefulness across different utilities axis. In other words, having one unit of labor effectively covering multiple usefulness of the product. If my fork is good for all kinds of forking uses, more generalized than a specialized fork, then I've eliminated the labor needed to create those specialized forks. The more generalized, generally, the more productive across the board. This can be noted too among other things show preferences towards industrial modes of creation. Fractal expansions of that growth rate would be orders of magnitude higher than industrial processes per SE. I digress. The main point as it relates to freedoms and liberties is that such quality factors can be understood as the maximal state of productive efficiency, and hence the baseline for labor's preference whereby a deviation from that would be a potential harm to the laborer's freedom and liberty. Maximal labor freedom is the most efficient mode of labor. While it is theoretically possible that monies could improve that rate, evidentially and logically they cannot. I mean to suggest that it is entirely possible for a tool like money to improve labor efficiencies as a matter of the evidence and the logical consequences of money's motives already alluded to they logically don't. The distortions of monies lead to differing aims of efficiency, I think we can conclude from this straightforwardly that it follows that moneyed systemizations are not maximal freedoms of commerce. Money's motives are chains, slavers' tools. Greed is a superlative bad. It is, I mean, a blameworthy sort of ethical foul which has a bit of extra seriousness to it. The sort of superfluous bad that is a particularly terrible sort of bad to do ethically speaking. It's a kind of horror predicated on something that is not based in but the aesthetics, See also diagnostics of fascistic and authoritarian views. It is such because the motive itself is a productional bad. It, that is, produces bads in the world as a motivational outcome. The definitiveness of it as being a tool that creates worse outcomes of freedom and liberties of labors. The constraints of those freedoms and liberties of labor, when labor is understood on its own terms of efficiencies. Greed in this sense being pretty much about monies, though I DK that we have to limit it to monies motives. There may be other, or a more generalized concept to which greed attaches its meaning to well. I do think perhaps that its attenuation of meaning is more properly understood as aesthetically attached, as in, the illusory structures of monies, its imaginative structural form, that imaginarium that money's motives overlay the commerce of labor being a constraining force on the freedoms and liberties of labors. The Imaginarium of Money's Motives Here I think we well get to the principal problems. The perverse motives of monies directs laborers towards actions they wouldn't otherwise prefer, thereby structuring society along lines that are even at odds with itself. This mode of understanding the situation is well facilitated by understanding the labor commerce as a base predicable commerce, as something natural in an important sense, and that deviations from it are at least ethical or not predicated upon their ability to improve upon the freedoms and liberties of labor's commerce. Money's motives are perverse in that they don't improve upon the freedoms and liberties of labor's commerce. Whereas, say, open source tools are arguably not perverse. While that is a well facilitation of the point, in that I think it can help people understand how there is something thoroughly odd and off-putting about commerce understood through the motives of monies. What really marks the moneyed motives as an imaginarium is that the valuation of monies is entirely devoid of any real worth. It's all monopoly monies. It's all of it playing pretend. To have a motive to do thus, and such for your labors is not to have that motive except for the imaginary valuation of money's motives. Hence, we can understand how folks may be walking around in a dream, clinging to strange beliefs regarding life predicated upon these pretend motivations. The motivation to scam someone, 
to that is actually believe that you want to spend your time trying to scam someone for why? For money. As a labor motive of commerce, there is no point in scamming anyone, but for the humor of it all winky face. The motivation to advertise your services to as many people as possible, while not eliminated entirely, is wildly different. While there are clearly exceptions, generally speaking labor doesn't want to do more labor, such violates the principle of intelligence. A plumber may be perfectly happy plumbing and doing their labor, but they've no incentives to push their labor onto people by advertising themselves, or making more of the labor than there is. They've motives to do so well for reasons of intelligence, overall that entails less labor. Of money's imaginarium, though, tis all those motivations that are for us. The billboards, the ads everywhere, each person trying their best to sell their labors to as many people as they can. It structures our lives at the moment, though it needn't. Not only in the sense that it occupies a fair amount of people's labors, but also in that we all also thereby come to live within that, to experience the ads, the horror of the blinding billboards, and the taxation of time by witness of those doing the advertising. The false sense of survival is a key component, though it needn't be. I mean that it is possible to have money's motives not be predicated upon a work-to-live mentality. Money can be used as a merely superfluous structure, a boon or bonus of reward. Such has been how it had been used in the past for the most part actually. I don't necessarily want to argue for a return to that, but it is instructive to note how wildly divergent the imaginarium of money's must musing has become. Currently a false sense of need for money in order to survive has been placed as an overlay upon the motivations of folks' lives more generally. This can't really be overstated, as it is so wildly divergent from the reality it is quite incredible and indicative of the horrors and problems with money's imaginarium of motivations. Relationships oft destroyed and predicated upon the valuations of monies, based upon a perception of survival or even extra boons in life. I mean of the latter, folks that predicate their loves upon monies and doing so because they believe that money is required for survival. It isn't in a strict sense, it is entirely an imaginative product a mass delusion on the populace, one that they could dispel at a whim of realization, both as a motivation and as the imaginarium itself. There is a collectiveness of effort to the imaginarium of survival, in that folks broadly hold it up by insistence upon it. Think I mean, how we might watch folks die for want of money. Just consider that people will watch other people die for want of money, an imaginary thing. Why? To uphold that imaginarium, to serve the illusion, those people must die because we insist upon the illusion of money's valuation being one of survivability itself. Likewise, folks will predicate their relationships, their loves, their most intimate lives upon the valuations of money's ill musings. And there is reasonableness to it, but that it be predicated upon a lie. If you accept the first lie, that of money's real valuation, then one can be prone to accept the next, don't though, that the money is required for survival, or required for greatness even. Wealth I mean being caught up in money's false valuations too, but that survival one, that drives far too much of people's motives even in love's musings. They give forth ill musings of love's devotions. It is reasonable I mean for someone to, in love's full embrace, also insist on the relationship in this or that way, at all or for all, predicated upon the false needs of survival that money's motivates. Folks will watch hordes of people die for want of money, Surely they would watch their loves fall apart over the same? Surely they would gladly even make love poorly just to make a better dollar? Do we even yet garner upon the real horrors of the Imaginarium? How words for instance can shape reality, and how meanings of words have their own existential state, concepts, ideas, etc., and how words shape that also come to shape the reality in terms of the non-conceptual. To speak of a concept in such ways is to gently shape the reality as it plays forth. If folks mask their loves predicated upon the concepts of money's motives, they also come to think of loves in that way. Not that such cannot be undone. Tis but a conceptual operati after all. To predicate the relation upon the false though creates these other wilder problems, whereby the undergirding reality may very well be far and away sweeter than all that false sense of needs for survival that money's illusory powers attempt to uphold. If, I mean, we serve not towards the illusory, breaking the imaginarium, those kinds of manifestations of love's musings may to depart. Healing love's musings and many bloomings, what horrors are wrought by the wars over money. Not this final battle, but in all the before, 
Recall how money's motives infested the aristocracies of old, which dominated the world's movements and wars throughout history. Not all people were motivated by monies. Only a small number were in those times. Commerce as a thing was confined, but it was within those confines that money's motives maintained, and wherein those motives of monies were dominant. They too were the ones that spoke of wars, who made of wars. How many wars that is that are little more than products of structure of the imaginarium, the motives of monies. So too therefore the divisions of nations thusly predicated. How many nations, all likely, whose borders are defined in the current by way of wars, and specifically by way of wars over money's motives. In the current moods, all the conflicts too, that we might say Brazil, is to speak in a way predicated upon money's motives. As if this thing, Brazil, or Canada, or Russia, or Egypt, etc., were a thing that would particularly exist but for money's motives. Not even by way of some far distance relation, see the proximate cause piece, but as a fairly obvious proximate cause, perhaps not the only one, but definitely a proximate causal relation between these. Even what we refer to when we refer to such things as nations, nationalism, etc., we are referring to a large body of laws that govern the movements of monies. Those movements being the sloshing around of the world's missteps. It isn't necessarily to say that no money's motives, no wars, no nations, etc. It is to say though that money's motives clearly instigate those sorts of things and shape them in a way that is fairly wildly divergent from motives other than money's. And that's such be worse for it. More wars, maybe wildly more wars even. Nations that are odd and oddly shaped relative to the bioregional makeup of the lands upon which they exist. Nations whose structures are surrounding different kinds of motives too, money's commerce. How we might raise our kids, how they be educated, towards what aims but that false sense of survival. Education of life, the world, ethics, philosophy, history, theologies, cultural lore and understanding. These sorts of things moneyed motives say not. Nah. The education has to be towards making that imaginarium, in service of it by way of weaving the illusions with their works, their very indoctrination to it. Save the little ones, it isn't that there is nothing underneath, there is the reality sans the imaginarium. It is that that reality is quite different from the imaginarium. There is just cause to be cautious I mean in simply removing monies from the equation entirely, even if removing money from the equation entirely is the aim. It is unclear how well society would adjust immediately. The chaos that looms over such a thing all on its own would be of major concern. But doing nothing is not an option. Imaginarium of money's musings needs to go. Note though the imaginarium structures upon other motives would persist. I think that noting how the imaginarium of money's motive stalks after our lives more than death is plenty sufficient to make the proper point here though. There are connections between aesthetics, beauties, loves, and so forth that are in whole or part imaginative in their structure. Hence, I mean I don't want to give the also false perspective of the real as being the base predicable upon which to. I'd go so far as to say that there is an ethical imperative obligatory and superlative, to properly address the questions of fundamental love's relationships in that light. To remove such a foundational structure, even if its needs do be false, and lead to worse results, if there is nothing to fill the gap of belief, the resulting chaos would likely also not be desirable. I mean, folks ought or may need to have some kinds of imaginative structures upon which to predicate their concepts of such things as loves. Beyond, say, merely mood of the moment, See therefore too all the criticism of individualism and liberalism. Those have to be taken seriously as areas against which to push. Here too, the musical, lyrical, poetical and philosophical discourse here I've been modeling provides a rather fascinating mode of communication to give purpose. There is, I mean, a something here of fruitfulness towards far-reaching aims to provide motives for love's movements. How beautiful a mode of communicative thought that can reach out to others towards such aims as these. Talk about love's many bloomings. Here there is a generousness of spirit to love's musings, a wanting of more and a passion to create the more, those lovely movements of loves. Pervos loves, loves which grow through another together. That counterpoint to per se loves gloom and ill-mused loves through centers of self. Money, monies I mean they were attempts at selfishness per se, were they not? And so I mean, all those horrors of loves are marked out well by money's ill movements. Are they not? Where mutual givingness be the motivational involved across the board. Hence, I mean how proper an order for me to have written these pieces in it.
how proper to the order they were thought in. To quote the poets, collected my belongings and I left the jail. Well, thanks for the time, I needed to think a spell. I had to think a while. I had to think a while. The ocean breathes salty. Won't you carry it in? In your head, in your mouth, in your soul. And maybe we'll get lucky and we'll both grow old. Well, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I hope so. To have done the other way round would have been to break the imaginarium without a substitute to take its place. Selfishness through another. The self is understood through another. The pervost relationships of love's many bloomings is a muse of why love comes first. That money's mapped out the inverted picture of love's proper musings. To quote the poets on the point, it all makes perfect sense. Expressed in dollars and cents, pounds, shillings and pence. Love comes first. See also the Rape of the Swan series. And note how much of that argues against the per se malfestation of love's muse bloomings. In the pragmatics of it all, folks can utilize the pervos framing to conceptualize and actualize love upon, and thereby prove, and use such as a means of supplanting the illusory structures of money's motives. The predicable reality of love's musings being key for the foundation. Conversely, everything may look silly if you understood it backwards. The motivations of money's making love's motivations look silly, frivolous even. Part of its illusory form, its distorted picture of love's many musings and bloomings towards some rather foolish points. There is an argument to be had here too, that the chains of money are constraints of love's conditioned and conditional loves. I don't want to pull too hard here, for there may very well be technical other conditions involved, but as a matter of analysis of the imaginarium, we may surmise that conditional loves are loves that are predicated upon the illusory. Unconditional love flows if not freely far more so, and differently than before. What comes forth sans money's maleficent musings be far more generous in spirit. Liberalism. Foundational criticism. If there are pervos ontological structures, to view them as if they were per se ontological structures is invalid. Leads to poor understandings of the situation in other words, and can give people the perception as if something that were clearly true was in fact false. These are akin to misperceptions, in that they misunderstand the ontological structure of the entities in question. The individual perspective just isn't the correct perspective to have, for when understanding love's relations, or many other sorts of relations, to come at it as if each were already separated from the reality, a self-same individual perspective, and each coming together to interact, rather than there having already been a connectivity between them, as that is structurally a part of who and what they are. It would be perhaps a bit akin to noting that to understand the atom one has to understand it as already being structurally inclusive of its parts. We can of course look at each individual part, and that understanding may even be valuable. I don't want to entirely dissuade from the notion of looking at the parts to find interesting new aspects. But the atom as such as an atom simply isn't reducible to its component parts. When we describe its parts interacting as if they were each acting on their own individual forces and nothing else, we are missing the point that the atom is a fundamentally different scalar structure. The scalar of the ontological entity actually plays a significant role in what forces are present, which are not. These scalar differences undercuts the main position of liberalism, at least if it were to be understood as a stand-in for the totality. It is true that, insofar as it goes, the individual does have their own proper scalar aspects of ethical concern, but all of ethical concerns are not reducible to it. But other scalars matter too. Love's relations are ontologically scalarly larger than individual relations. When folks attempt to analyze ethics to the individual, they are simply misunderstanding the ethical structures. But here we can see how there are connectivities between otherwise disparate entities already in place. Hence, consider the Heideggerian point of discovery as an uncovering, as if there were a hiddenness to the reality, that hiddenness being the scalar differences. I'd suspect it may work always too e.g. this, or that scalar has some degrees of hiddenness to it, such that from any angle we are still in a position of there being a hiddenness and an exposure. I suspect such works well as a way of understanding how different scalars might view each other. But the main point here is this. Liberalism with its hyper-focus on individualism as a ubiquitous means of measure is simply false in its ubiquitousness. It provides wrong answers to basic ethical questions. It presents false realities, as if they were the real via, for instance, the imaginarium of money's motives, and it induces people towards delusional modes of thinking, in the sense of as if gross misperceptions of reality were occurring. Viewing pervos entities, 
distorted as if they were per esse, 